So how do you survive in um, in the U.S. as a French guy? So long. I've been asked this because you know March is a Francophile month worldwide. You know, yes, there's a cultural event all through the world. Uh, try to distribute the beauty of French and its culture. So it gives me the opportunity to uh, reassess my presence here in the USA as a musician and, and a songwriter and then just as a guy, as a dad and uh, I was trying to explain uh, what was going on to me in the 80s um, I was really running away from France because I thought France was really just not good at all I just didn't like France at all I ended up, uh, I thought, also thought blues was dead. I came here in this country to play blues music. But in the 80s, I thought it blues was dead. So uh, I uh, plunged into another artistic endeavor. I, I was doing sound art. I uh, just basically put my guitar in its case for a couple of years. And as I was sewing, I did sew a couple of microphones in my shoulder pads and started recording everything. You know, trucks, machines, people, you know, urban landscape, and I would just put them on quarter-inch tape and layering them and doing sound paintings and doing performance art, you know. Really far away from the blues. And um, I was doing uh, things with uh, dancers and crazy people who would just act like robots. We did a show at the grand opening of the Mobius Performance Center. And there I met a, 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 my first theater director there, who asked me to do sounds for them. I'm like, okay, you know, I'll teach me what you do and I'll do sound for you. And um, the theater was a movement theater, and I stayed in, in that place for five years. And that's how I became a mime. I'm okay now. I'm okay. <laughs> the, th the, ther the gestalt therapy worked. <laughs> but you know, it takes, it takes quite a, a, a certain amount of courage to be a mime in the 80s. I don't know if you guys remember, but it was, it was a big wave of mime hating. <laughs> mime hatred. I mean, it was intense. You, st you still, actually, there's leftovers of that. There's, there's still a. Um, um, on, if you go online, it's, there's several mind-hating websites which became really violent and bloody. I mean, it's just, I don't know what color blood of the mind is, but I don't want to see it, you know? I mean, you had like t-shirts and bumper stickers and jokes going around. Like, how do you kill a mind? You use a silencer. <laughs> My favorite was a, a mime is a wonderful thing to waste. <laughs> so I was mime. I was I was doing something very French again. I said, "Dude, you're doing music concrete with your sounds, and you're mime. You know, you're running away from France, and look what you're doing." Like, oh, I guess. Uh, see, the apple doesn't fall fall far from the tree, and no matter how hard the apple tries. So maybe I was too French for my own good. But I remember the first, uh, my first mime, solo mime gig. It was kind of a, it was a memorable experience. And I, oh, I owe that first job to a French champion company, I think it was Cordon Rouge, who struck a deal with all the liquor store in Massachusetts. Any liquor store who, could, uh, who would buy 10 cases would get a free mime. <laughs> I, and I guess I was on the mime list at the time. So the mime would be, you know, miming for a couple of hours and, and pouring free sample of champagne, you know, to the neighborhood, you know. My great deal, you know, a couple of hundred bucks. The thing that I didn't know, didn't like too much, that I had to wear the standard mime thing, you know, with the stripes, the red scarf, the beret. That's like the Hollywood mime. You know, I think it's, we owe that standardization to us or us, so, you know. But, you know, I put on my clown white. I was really good at it, you know, clown white, a uh, geisha, you know. And uh, stripes and a red scarf and a beret. And I hop on the bus to my first mime gig. Now, well, hey, just try to uh, stay in character, you know. 
Uh, so the, the best, uh, you know, I mean, how bad can it be? A couple of hours, 200 bucks, serving free champagne, you know, it's like, great gig. How, how bad can it be? Well, the bus ride was really long and took me, took me to parts of Boston that I didn't know. And the bus ride became excruciatingly long the second I realized I was the only white guy on the bus. And boy, I was white. So that was a very strange feeling. And then I realized I actually had my face on, you know, so there was a double layer here. And I was, uh, I felt very comfortable. I was screaming inside, I said, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not like, you know, the other mimes. <laughs> I took some comfort in realizing that I was not like the other white guys out there. But, you know, I mean, uh, don't judge me by the color of my skin, basically, you know. I could be, you know, black underneath. I mean, mime is not a race, you know, black folks can be mimes too. Especially, you know, with my Senegalese heritage, you know. But somehow I felt, really, I felt more comfortable in that all-black bus as a mime than I felt in the streets, you know, in Newbury streets with all this mime hating, which seemed to be generated by white folks. What's up with that? I guess it's, uh, it's, it's tough for a black person to hate a mime because it's be too obvious. I guess, you know, it's, you can't do that. It'd be too it'd be funny, I guess, I don't know. And I was wondering, why is that mime hating thing is a white thing? I think, I think some white people don't like mimes because mimes are, are whiter than them. <laughs> <laughs> 